there, everybody. Um, that is here today for our, our cook-along um, for Go Green Week. We are joined by Mags Hall, green activist and parliamentary researcher, which we're very excited for. Um, first of all, I'd like to say thank you to Mags for being here. We're very excited to have you and to have an interesting chat um, and to hear all about kind of the politics of food and everything that you do. Um, and a whole bunch of things that I'm sure we can get on to chat about. Obviously today we're making tandoori, cauliflower and dal. So I suppose we can get started with that while you tell us a little bit about you, what you do, um, and that would be great. Sure, okay, this is gonna be a test for me uh, to talk and speak at the same time because I've not done this for a while. <laughs> um, I'm gonna just get stuck dripping my cauliflower. Oh, also now it's weird, my camera too is below you we're kind of like a heart on my screen we're like a hard looking square and i'm all over the place anyway <laughs> i'm going to start prepping this cauliflower then me too i will do yeah. the same cool yeah thank you so much for having me along it's really nice to um be speaking to a bunch of people do something different on a thursday night um i as you said in the introduction i'm um an activist with the greens i am a candidate for the upcoming elections in scotland and fife and um, I'm the co-convener of the Scottish Green Party Council, which is the body that represents the grassroots membership. So we've got various committees and we've got political leaders who are Patrick and Lorna, who you might sit around, um, but then there's this body of council, which is all our members and our branches and our representative groups, and I chair that. Um, and yeah, my day job is working in the Scottish Parliament with the Green MSPs. And one of the many things I do is um, specialise in food and agriculture policy um, and yeah my background if you want to know a bit about what I did before politics um, so my background was in was in food sovereignty activism um, and community community work around food and access to land and food growing um, and community gardens um, and I got involved in politics around about I initially got involved as a volunteer around about the uh, independence referendum, but then I kind of seriously got involved at the last four of those elections. Um, worked on the campaign for that, um, managed to get uh, Mark Driscoll elected in Mid Scotland and Fife, and then have been working in Parliament ever since. And for a kind of biased thing here, you are a graduate of the University of Glasgow, so we are especially happy to have I, you. I am. Yes, I am. I went to Glasgow Uni 2003 to 2000. I graduated in 2007 just in time for the last financial crisis. <laughs> so yeah, no, I loved, I loved going to uni in Glasgow. Um, but what did I do? Four tablespoons of yogurt in my bowl. So then I have to kind of think about this at the same time. Uh, yeah, I did English literature and history of art in Glasgow um, and I really enjoyed it. But like looking back now, I wish I'd done some kind of like politics or policy type thing. I think, yeah, I think it's really hard. It was certainly hard for me as a young person um, decided what I wanted to do at uni um, and I went had an amazing university experience but it took kind of university and several years afterwards of working in different fields and doing lots of traveling and volunteering with lots of groups to figure out what my interests were and where my interests lies and it was very much around um, food and land rights and politics um, so yeah but it was still it was still good to be in Glasgow for those years yeah, so that is kind of good to hear because I am at Glasgow doing politics. So from a biased perspective for you to say that you wish that you'd done politics, I'm like, okay, great. Maybe I am doing the right thing. That's perfect. Maybe that's the thing that you always kind of think maybe I should have done something else or blah, blah, blah. For those of you out there who did it, I did a totally unrelated subject and still managed to figure out what I wanted to do. So certainly if you're interested in politics or activism of any kind, there's lots of other ways you can get involved without having done a degree. It's not a disaster if you find you're doing a degree that's not quite what you wanted to do yeah I think that's definitely encouraging um I think a lot of people are maybe panicking well I think maybe everyone does throughout their degree and you're like oh gosh is this right so that's good so I guess maybe I have a question about how how you kind of like what got you into community food and food facilitation and um everything to do with food and and land rights what kind of was the thing that got you interested in that to make sure I get my spices right now. I'm talking well, about the minute. Yeah. That's I'm actually helpful because I also need to know what spice I'm doing. So feel free to say that out loud. <laughs> okay, so I'm doing. I've got my yogurt and I've got my chili flakes. I'm putting in a tablespoon of so I've got a teaspoon of chili flakes. I'm gonna. Oh, I've got a, bit, a really big lump of 
<laughs> that'll go in. Tablespoon of cumin and I've got that recipe pinned up here. A tablespoon of garlic powder. Oh, I was going to say, if you don't have garlic powder, you can just use grated fresh garlic. But garlic powder is really useful because it doesn't burn in the same way that garlic does. So, um, yeah, it's quite a handy thing to have. Garlic powder. Good tip. A teaspoon of garam masala and two teaspoons of salt. Okay. Um, yeah, so how did I get involved? So I, I was always interested in foods from a cooking and eating point of view because I think everybody is, let's face it. <laughs> but it was only really after I left, and I worked in hospitality on and off during uni as well, which I quite liked, but is like, for anybody who works in a bar or a restaurant, and you all know how incredibly tiring and antisocial it is. So I was like, mm, don't really want to go down that line because I like to have a life as well. Um, so I, after university, went to New Zealand for a while. Well, I went to Asia, first of all, and then I ended up in New Zealand and I had a year's visa for New in New Zealand. And I ended up working on organic farms in the South Island, um, small scale organic farms. Uh, there's a really big movement in New Zealand um, called, um, they call it lifestyle blocks. So there's a, there's a lot of land in New Zealand. It's more affordable than here in the UK. Um, and also it's like the perfect climate for growing things. It's a really, really beautiful place to go. So there's a lot of people who buy what's called a lifestyle block, which is what we would call a small holding. So a house with a really decent amount of land on it and you can grow food for yourself and for your local community and for community supported agriculture projects and things. So I went to South Island in New Zealand working on those and it was just amazing. It just really opened up my eyes to an alternative way of living, but also an alternative way of organizing as a community you know, as a physical community but also as a community of food producers as well because um, there were just some amazing I see lots of people just doing food production in their spare time whilst having other jobs kind of similar to our crofting communities really here in Scotland um, but having a really good quality of life but also yeah selling their produce in local markets selling it at car boot sales like, it, that was a huge eye opener for me when I went to my first car boot sale in New Zealand and I thought it would be like a Scottish car boot sale and it would be people selling like old books and like copies of the Beano and things and then no like a car boot sale in New Zealand half of it is people selling food out of the boot of their car which was amazing um so yeah so that really kind of got me interested and I learned some basic food growing skills there as well um came back to Scotland dug up my parents' back garden to turn it into uh, a veg patch and kind of got interested in food growing from that point of view. Um, but I, had, I had worked in various different jobs for a few years, always doing kind of food growing on the side as a hobby, um, but kind of started to realise I was more and more interested in that. Um, and so I started looking for opportunities to volunteer as well. So there was a few different community gardens that I got involved with, but one of the projects I was really interested with, I started volunteering with a project in Fife that works with um, the homeless homeless people. Um, so it wasn't it wasn't street homeless; it was people who were in temporary accommodation who had no access to outdoor space. Um, and we I helped set up an allotment for them so that you know people who were in temporary accommodation, living in flats and things, could come and spend some time outdoors and grow food as well. So that was really cool and interesting. Um, you get a bit of a life story here for me. <laughs> We're going on a journey here. That's what we yes. On a journey. Cool. Um, so I ended up through different... Um, by that point, I was working in the charity fundraising sector. And I ended up working for a project in Fife called the Fife Diet, which um, was set up just by a family in 2008. And it started off... Um, uh, it, it was a writer who decided he would do an experiment to try and only eat food from Fife for a year. Uh, with him and his family and would blog about it and it just took off massively it got lots of coverage lots of media coverage and things and so he turned it into a project so it was like a project you could join you could be a member of the Fife Diet um, and we did lots of um, we made lots of resources about eating local food and we would do lots of events um, and we did like um, political lobbying as well around food justice and food equality. Um, so that was amazing. I absolutely loved that. And that was kind of my big break in realizing that you can make a career out of activism as well. Um, but that was, it was, as with lots of stuff, it's always reliant on funding. You have to do lots of applications, get money here and there. Um, and it became quite a strain. So that wrapped up in 2015. Um, and on the back of that, I then did freelance work for a few years, working with different projects in Fife and Edinburgh on similar, um, 
activism work, um, facilitating cooking workshops, facilitating food growing workshops, helping do project design for people who wanted to set up community gardens. Um, and yeah, just really, really, really loved it. But politics was calling <laughs> because I have to say throughout that, so, so I loved the, the community activism side of things, but and I, and I think that the power of grassroots movements is huge. But whilst working particularly in low income communities, so we did some projects, I did a project um, called Edible Estates in Magdalene in Edinburgh, and I also worked in um, a project in Kirkcaldy that was in a low income community as well. Um, you just were constantly coming up with the huge barriers that are caused by inequality. So uh, inequality around um, income, but also inequalities around access to land, inequalities around access to food itself, where people can get their food from, the choices that people are able to make being extremely limited by their circumstances. And so it was a real eye up there for me. And what I found was that there were lots and lots of people doing really amazing stuff, grassroots on the ground, but there were very few people talking about this at a higher up level where we desperately needed policy change. Um, so yeah, so that's why I then got involved in, you know, I was kind of, my interest was piqued by the independence referendum, definitely, but actively becoming, you know, becoming more active in politics. It was very much around the fact that nobody really was talking about food justice in Scotland at that point um, and the inequalities around food. Um, which which were really impacting on people's day-to-day -day lives but also impacting on people's abilities to make choices around or, or to kind of play their part in um tackling climate change as well so so yeah so that's how i ended up going kind of from taking a side step from community activism side of things to more formal politics mm -hmm. It's really interesting. I think that's like kind of a dilemma that a lot of people have, right? Being really, really interested yeah. in these causes, but not necessarily wanting to take that leap into more formal politics. So it's really interesting to think kind of the the perspective that actually a lot of the time to, to make real change, like you kind of need that push from above as well. Um, yeah, absolutely. You need it at all levels. That's the thing. Around all things, but particularly around about food. You know, if you're going to make a difference for, to what people eat um, and how our diet impacts the planet and stuff, for, for far too long it's been presented as a personal choice um, and that, that we could all make decisions and it, it absolutely you know we, we do we all have power in our pound you know we have we have power to make decisions every time we shop but there are so many people that don't have that power and so they need people speaking up for them as well and also we need structural change like there's there's such structural barriers within our food system that that builds inequality into it so grassroots activism is only going to get so far in that mm -hmm. I wonder that like, okay, so it's a really big issue. Um, my temptation is to start digging down into some of those, those <laughs> issues because I think that totally is on theme with what we want to chat about and people in power and planet and how all of it intersects. Um, but what I'm particularly interested in, because I feel like, so we, as, as kind of, we're mainly students here, um, I know a lot of my friends are vegetarian like that seems we kind of focus a lot on individual choice I would say like and that kind of seems to be the way in which we can make the biggest difference it feels the most kind of accessible to us so I guess what I'm really interested in chatting about is particularly kind of like the the wider how that all kind of connects to kind of farming agriculture the sustainability in those areas and the stuff that maybe is slightly more invisible to us because it's, it kind of is, is a bit deeper than a, a choice that an individual can make. So, yeah. um, so I guess to kind of talk about that um, and maybe the sustainability side of farming and policy, um, is there anything in particular? I guess I've kind of in my little notes, I'm like looking at my note questions over that <laughs> about food sovereignty, um, mm. which I think is, is really interesting because it kind of encompasses that full range from kind of farmer to consumer um so could you give a definition of food sovereignty it would be helpful to i can but first of all i'm going to put my cauliflower in the oven if it, i'm going to show you my i've got my my cauliflower is smothered and oh no there's a bit of mess there i can just see now oh well it's most, i'll show you that that side's better that side's better smothered so i'm going to put this in the oven just now and i'll come back and tell you about food sovereignty <laughs> Very nice. See, mine's looking far more yellow. I think I may be over turmeric, um, but oh well, it's also smothered, so I guess that's the main thing. Um, I feel like I'm slightly, I'm doing like a, a sort of artistic, artistic work here. Um, 
trying to oh. trying to kind of cover it now. I have put a timer on for 35 minutes. My cauliflower was quite small. So if you've got a small one, 35 to 40 minutes should be okay. If, it, if you've got a really beast of a one, it'll need longer. So we're just going to keep an eye on it. Okay, food sovereignty. I'm going to tell you about food sovereignty whilst I'm putting a pan of rice on as well because I'm cooking for my boyfriend. He's away to do a two-hour ride on his indoor bike trainer and he will want rice with his. He doesn't think it's a meal if I just give him cauliflower and dal. So I'm going to get that on as well. Um, so, so food sovereignty is a, is a global movement and it's the one that my politics and my food politics in general definitely identifies with the most. And it, 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 it fundamentally, it's about putting control of the food system in the hands of um, producers, but also consumers as well. So particularly here in the UK, but globally, our food system is controlled very much by the middlemen. It's controlled by powerful distribution companies. It's controlled by supermarkets. It's controlled by people who create the seeds, um, even that. And, um, and the people who actually produce our food, so the, the, the farmers, but also you know the, the cooks, the people working in hospitality, um, and the people who are on the other end buying it, spending their money for it, have very little control and very little say. Um, and that's the case right across the world where you go, it looks different in different places. So food sovereignty was established as a, a movement of peasant farmers in the global south. But since then, it's become a global movement because, because of that um, kind of, yeah, that, that power inequality that exists right across the world and actually realising that in, in, in addressing that, that, that there's a, a solidarity there between both producers and consumers um, in trying to, to wrestle back control. Um, so it was founded as it was founded by uh, uh, in the Global South, I think it was in 2012, there was a big conference in sub-Saharan Africa of small scale food producers who were fighting seed companies at the time. They were looking to unite together to, to fight seed companies who were coming in and trying to sell them um, genetically modified versions of crops that they didn't want to grow anyway, but they were being told they had to grow. Um, and they put together, so the people at that conference, it was in a place called Nileni, and they put together the Declaration of Nileni, which is like a founding document of, of food sovereignty. Um, and since then, it's kind of grown and developed. But there's six principles. I have these on the screen because I always forget about these. <laughs> But this kind of sums it up really nicely. Um, the, kind of the six founding pillars of food sovereignty, which is that, uh, food, uh, that food sovereignty focuses on food for people and that, that the right to food, which is healthily and culturally appropriate, is a basic legal demand we should all have. Secondly, it values food producers, um, and that includes uh, small smallholder farmers, it includes fishermen, it includes um, uh, migrant food producers and um, uh, herders. Thirdly, it localizes food systems. And, and fourthly, it puts control locally, not just on those food systems, but control over territory, land, grazing, water, seeds, livestock, all the fundamental building blocks of the food system. Um, fifthly, it builds skill, knowledge and skills, and in particular, small scale technologies that are suitable for small scale food production. Um, and lastly, it, it works with nature, um, which is kind of a, a, a fundamental and a given. Um, so as you see, it is quite a broad, um, it, it's quite, it's got quite a broad spectrum um, of, of issues that it covers, um, but it really encapsulates the fact that that justice and sustainability go hand in hand, and that you can't really tackle one without the other. Um, both, yeah, on a social and environmental level. That's interesting. It makes me think a lot about kind of, you know, like corporate sustainability um, in terms of like most major supermarkets have their kind of sustainability policies and. They're pretty comprehensive and kind of convincing. Like even for me, if I like read up on like Tesco's website and what they say about sustainability, it's like, okay, yeah, they're doing a lot. But actually when it is these big kind of bodies that own all the food production or are in control of it at least, um, yeah. it means that people are always going to be disadvantaged. They're so far, I mean, sorry, there's I'm off camera. I'm just getting my rice from the, but the water from my rice. Um, the issue with corporate social responsibility projects um, it's, and corporate sustainability is it all looks good on paper and it could all sound fine but they are so far removed from what they're actually doing and particularly with supermarkets supermarkets are are not producing the foods you know they're 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 part of a system and they have the power within that system um but you know they're yeah, it's, it's very easy for them to, to, to make commitments, but they're not the ones who are actually having to deliver on it. They're passing on the responsibility elsewhere um, to, you know, up to, to, to farmers and to food producers. Um, 
and yeah it's it it's not just it's not just a question of justice it's a question of um, fundamental economic sustainability as well um, so the particularly in the uk you know food producers receive such a small proportion of the money that's spent on food like annually by the public um, and they're squeezed ever tighter and tighter um and, into very difficult you know there's, there's a huge issue in the uk with unfair contracts between supermarkets and food producers still so and then on top of that they're they're um the people they're selling to the supermarkets are making all these grand statements around sustainability um, but expecting the farmers to actually deliver on that so they're being squeezed at so many ends and in actual fact not getting a fair price for their food um yeah being being forced into into unfair trading practices um and also being expected to deliver on something which um you know they should be the absolute we, we should be holding our farmers to account for how they use the land um, and, and what they're producing and how they're producing it and the environmental impact of that but in exchange, we've got a responsibility to, 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 to pay them fairly and to make sure that they can they can make a living out of this, which a lot of the time they can't at the moment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Like, I think there's, because I guess they, they have the kind of the prominent role in terms of how food is produced and, and what's happening and how sustainable it is. We kind of, ex I think there's an expectation that they'll foot the bill and that they'll be in charge of making that change happen, which obviously just isn't, isn't doable and you're going to end up you're kind of putting farmers in a rock and a hard place saying like okay yeah. you know to use a, a cliched expression um yeah. yeah like it's 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 not really yeah. possible to expect change when you're not not allowing it to happen um exactly and this is where this is where food policy comes in because this is farmers are stuck in a rock and hard place and being asked to deliver so much for so little in return um because they have no other option like it's we have constructed a, a food system that is so dominated by the supermarkets and by you know big big corporations that that farmers have nowhere else to go but it doesn't have to be that way because it's it's food policy and it's politics political strategy and political ideology that has got us to this point in the first place but we can also use policy to to bring much more fairness and diversity into the food system as well um, and there's there's loads of strategies that we could be pursuing to kind of break the dominance of of supermarkets and, and um food you know, multinational food corporations but at the moment we're choosing not to do that so. mm -hmm. yeah um so i guess are there any easily digestible of those things that we can talk about like in terms of i'm sure it's a huge issue that is hard to tackle but like how can we start to bring about about those attitudes into our parliamentary policies like if yeah, yeah. how can we bring it in basically okay well maybe so i'm just gonna i'm just wearing out my lentils just now if that's a bit noisy how many are you doing uh, 200 grams of lentils um so maybe it's best to start talking about what we're doing at the moment in Scotland to try and kind of set the scenes. Mm -hmm. um, because the answer is we're not doing anything. <laughs> you know, it's quite an easy answer. Um, no, uh, up until now, uh, the, the, this current Scottish government, certainly since the last election in 2015, uh, 2016, has an extremely um, laissez-faire attitude when it comes to the food system. It is market-driven, it's business as usual, um, and they've been... <laughs> It's, it's don't rock the boat. Everything is fine. We're not going to accept that there's any kind of issues. Um, environmental stuff, we can tack that on at the sides with a few, a few incentives here and there, a few tweaks to the agricultural payment scheme. It'll all be fine. Um, and, and in a large part, they've been allowed to get away with that because of Brexit, I would say. Um, Brexit has introduced so much uncertainty, particularly into to farmers. Um, it's they've spent the entire Scottish Parliament, Scottish government, I should say, spent the last five years saying, oh, but Brexit is really difficult, so we can't change anything at the moment, we just have to wait and see what happens. But it's very much a cover for the, the, the strategy that they're going down, which is leave it to the market and it'll all be okay. Um, there was a proposal um, to bring in um, a Good Food Nation bill, they called it, and it was meant to be an overarching food policy bill. Um, so yeah, I should say that so yeah, up until now, our agricultural policy has been entirely driven by the EU. Um, we, we've been part of their common agricultural policy, and I can talk about that a little, a little bit later on if people have more questions. Um, but, and, and then other aspects like food standards have also been driven by the EU, but there are lots of parts of the food policy that aren't driven by the EU. So things like read about uh, food policy to do with health, 
uh, food that we use in schools, food that we use for public procurement, all that kind of thing. We've had, we've, we've, we've always been able, it's always been devolved, we've always been able to do that, our own kind of thing on it. Um, and we've just not, not taken up that opportunity. So last session in Parliament, um, there was quite a good minister in charge of well, the Cabinet Secretary for Food and Rural Affairs, a guy called Richard Lockhead, who started talking the right way around, hang on, um, our food policy at the moment is very disjointed. We have, you know, we, uh, and as I mentioned there, we have things like uh, people looking at food from a health point of view, people looking at food from a procurement point of view, people looking at the economic aspects, people look at farm. It was all like split across different portfolios. So he started talking about bringing them all together um, and, and having an overarching food policy for Scotland, which would be called the Good Food Nation policy. And it would bring all these strands together under one banner for the first time. Um, and then that developed into a proposal for a bill. So in 2016, the SNP went into the election proposing a Good Food Nation bill. As the Greens, we proposed something similar. We just called it the Food and Farming Act. Um, and, and, and I think Labour and the Lib Dems as well. So we went into this session, there was a real understanding that actually, if we're going to challenge, if we're going to tackle the multiple issues around food, we need um, a multi-leveled approach and we need, we need to stop thinking about silos. Um, but then after the 2016 election, there was a change of minister. I mean, I have a man called Fergus Ewing, who's in charge of food policy. Um, it, his job title doesn't include the word food in it. The, 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 he's, he's the cabinet secretary for rural economy. Um, the, the committee that looks at this in Parliament doesn't have the word food in it. Um, it's rural economy again. Um, so it's, it's, it's just really amazed me how much um, a change of politicians and a change of advisors at the top could really, really turn the strategy around um, for, for a whole Parliament. Um, and yeah, and then with Brexit coming along as well, it's meant that the only, so, so the bill got dropped um, there were a few initiatives. Um, Fergus Ewing has set up a whole load of different panels and working groups to make policy recommendations. Some of them have been good, some of them haven't been. None of it has been acted upon. Um, as it, everything has been around, don't rock the boat. It, it's too, um, yeah, it, it's, it's now is not the time to do it. We'll do it in the future. Which as an activist is incredibly frustrating because particularly around about climate change, we know that we can't, we can't sit on our hands and say, oh, well, we'll see how Brexit goes. Like 10 years time, we might start doing something around climate and agriculture because it's too late to do that. Um, so yeah, so it's been quite a frustrating time to be in parliament, but at the same time, there's been quite a, I would say there's been broad agreement that the lack of progress has been incredibly poor and incredibly frustrating. Um, and yeah, we'll have to, I think there's, there's, there's gonna be an interesting election. I think people will be talking around food um, from a climate perspective, um, because we're going into this election with much a much greater public awareness about climate issues, but also um, from a social justice point of view as well, the pandemic's made people really sit up and, and notice um, just how much inequality there is in Scotland still and, and how, how that um, manifests itself in terms of food. Yeah, I think that, I think kind of the pandemic has done a few things in terms of, I feel like you can't read, like you can't read an article about food anymore without it kind of starting off saying, you know, the pandemic really shook people and made us realize how fragile our food system is. Um, and also like how many people are in these unstable positions. The other thing is, um, so there was the Good Food Nation bill and I think, am I right in saying so now there's recently been proposed kind of a right to food bill, which was originally part of Good Food Nation. And it seems like that bit's kind of been kind of... Yeah, yeah. So, so, so what are the recommendations that came? So whilst we didn't get a bill, what Fergus Ewing did do was set up, he set up a, a food commission which was um, food producers and third sector organisations um, getting around to talk about, he said, we're not going to do a bill, but, but tell us what the government could be doing otherwise. And they came up with a really decent set of proposals. But what, one of them was a bill, which he wasn't happy about, was to say, was to enshrine the right to food in, in Scots law. Because, um, yeah, it, once we start to talk about food as a human rights issue, um, it, it takes away, you know, talking earlier on about about food as a personal choice, and it, it is if you if you're in a lucky, a fortunate enough position to be able to make those choices. If you're not, we need to talk about it as a rights issue. Um, so, yes, so that was one of the recommendations that came out of that. The government refused to take it forward. 
So um, a Labour MSP has now brought forward a member's bill. Um, what I would say, it's only just been lodged. I'm a little bit confused because it has only just been lodged in Parliament and Parliament finishes in four weeks and the bill will automatically fall. But I think, I assume that they're doing it with a view to bringing it back after the next session, after, after the election. So, so that should be interesting. I, mean, I think recognising the right to food is important, but it is just a start. And what we need, in addition to a right to food in law, we need mechanisms to deliver that. So one of the other things that's been recommended is um, uh, making a statutory food commission, which would look at all the different parts of policy. So your health policy, your environment policy, your education policy, and um, look at which parts of that impact the right to food. And it would be kind of like a gatekeeper really for any, any legislation or policy that we put through that impacted on food, they would take a look at it and make recommendations or make, you know, recommend that we refuse legislation or whatever on the basis of whether it improves or hinders our right to food. Um, so, so yeah, we need that. And then we also, we just, we need a willingness. It's still, a commission's still not gonna get us fully out of this silo thinking that goes on. We need a recognition right across government that food is a priority, it's important, but it's also a way of delivering change. It's a way of delivering better health impacts. It's a way of delivering climate change reductions. It's a way of, of, of reducing social inequalities as well. And, and seeing that as a priority that they should be delivering on. It's something that is very kind of interesting and current for the moment, um, which I would just like to acknowledge is kind of the, the impact of Brexit on Scottish farmers. So I know we've kind of touched on it a little bit and so if most of our kind of agriculture well if all of our agri agricultural policy was coming from the eu where does that kind of place us now if if things are pretty stagnant would you say yeah so what we did so from a legislation point of view the um parliament i wouldn't say chose uh, they didn't really have a choice <laughs> the only uh, the, the scottish government's approach was to copy and paste our existing agricultural policy um, so pretty much all the legislation has been copied and pasted over. For some stuff, that's fine. So for things like food standards, we think it's important that we just maintain food standards um, with the EU because the EU already has some of the highest food standards in the world. Um, if we're going to continue trading with them, we need to maintain that. So that's all fine. But when it comes to agriculture, um, the, the, so the common agricultural policy, which we were part of, um, it gets reviewed every six or seven years or so. So we've copied and pasted the version of the common agricultural policy, which we were working under until we left. Um, and there's a new version coming in at the end of this year, which is quite different and has much stronger environmental focus. Um, and so basically we, we're now stuck with a policy that's out of date, which the rest of Europe has rejected. And the, this, certainly this session, the session just passed, the Scottish government were absolutely adamant that they weren't for changing it at all so we've, we've there's been a massive missed opportunity there in terms of policy to, to update how we fund um agriculture and i think it's kind of going off on a tangent here this is something that, that i think we we forget about um particularly when we're thinking about food and climate change which is that the the, the most polluting parts of the agriculture sector in Scotland, which is the beef and lamb industry, uh, but also like intensive arable agriculture as well. We all pay for this as a society. We spend, I think it's like, well, I should know the budget because I've just been writing papers on it. But I can't get it back. So over, it, it's billions. I think it was two and a half billion over the course of the last like five years, purely on agricultural subsidies. Um, so there's this really powerful mechanism there. When you, when I'm not, I am not anti-subsidy at all. There's some people who say we just scrap subsidies. Absolutely not. But we should be using subsidies to deliver what we want from our food system, and that should be good quality, sustainably produced food, actively working to reduce its impact on the planet. And right now, there's there there's there's pointers towards that, and there's there's voluntary schemes that farmers can sign up to and get paid a little bit more money. At the moment, we're, we're giving farmers direct economic support with very little being asked of in return. Um, and it's just, it's, it's a, a massive, massive missed opportunity. Um, 
It is Brexit, though. So yeah, so 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 we've we've basically just copied and pasted policy. Um, the 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 impact on on most of the farming sector, the food sector, hasn't been as great as it could have been. So we did manage when we when we finally left um, in January. We did manage to get a trade deal with the EU that on the surface of it protected most of the sector. So it removed the direct tariffs um, with one kind of really big, it seems tiny, but actually economic, it's quite important. Um, the, the UK government forgot about the seed potato sector. So the seed potato sector is really important in Scotland. Scotland's one of the, the uh, from a quality, not from necessarily from volume, but from, from a, a quality of produce angle, seed potatoes are some of the best in the world. Um, and we get a lot of money for, for selling seed potatoes to other countries. Um, we, uh, the seed potato sector is now having to pay tariffs. I can't remember exactly what it is, but they have to pay tariffs to send into the EU. Um, it's not hit the sector yet because because the way because they're selling seeds, most of they managed to get most of their product out before Christmas. Crisis talks going on at the moment because it will basically be put an end to the sector overnight. You can kill off a sector. You can you can make our products so uncompetitive that it's impossible to sell it and with something like seed potatoes the whole thing is about export it we keep some for ourselves to, to grow for our domestic potato market but it's about creating a really good product that we're going to sell to the rest of the world um and and yeah it's just been devastated uh, the other big challenge that brexit has brought is around the paperwork um, and the and just the, the bureaucracy and the administration which i'm sure lots of people seem um is still causing delays to at the border um, for things like vegetables, the kind of vegetables that we're exporting, we don't actually export a huge amount of it, but the, the, they, they have okay shelf lives. But for the seafood sector, it's an absolute disaster if there are any delays at all at the border. And so they're still going. Um, so yes, yeah, seafood companies are, are, are really struggling. Um, I think, uh, again, I, I'm not saying, it, it, it has still been difficult, but what I would say is I think that some of, some of the difficulties that could have been Brexit related or being masked by the pandemic at the moment. So the sector is also struggling massively by the closure of the hospitality sector, um, uh, particularly a lot of Scottish producers. So seafood um, uh, sales, the domestic seafood market is almost exclusively to hospitality, uh, but also the meat, the, the, the meat sector as well also sells a lot to hospitality. So um, they were already struggling um, and they're receiving financial support. But as we sort of start to come out of the pandemic and get back to normal, I think that's when we'll start to see the fill, fill in back to Brexit on those. I kind of want to go back to kind of talking about farmer subsidies, just because I mm -hmm. think it's interesting in terms of farmers aren't getting enough money from, you know, the people that are actually selling yeah. their produce to, um, but then getting subsidies. I'm just, for someone that doesn't know a lot about that, I'm just intrigued by the kind of balance between those things. Um, in terms of the fact that farmers aren't getting fair prices and then um, in order to they kind of need to be supported. Like, not that, of course, subsidies are a great thing. Um, I'm just wondering about the relationship between those two things, if you're able to talk about that a little yeah. bit. To the layman, it seems to make no economic sense at all. Um, so, the, so the principle of subsidies is sound and is something that is actually in line with food sovereignty uh, principles, which is that food is, is not a normal commodity. It's a public good and it's a resource that we all need. And so it's within the collective good, you know, it's, it, the, the collective society, it's within our interest to make sure that we have enough food and that it's affordable. And so that was the basis of the common agricultural policy, which was um, set up in Europe after the Second World War, although there have been a history of agricultural subsidies prior to that. Um, the problem is, is they become so distorted over time that they no longer, they're no longer linked to that, that, that core principle of, of delivering public goods. Um, they've become about um, uh, controlling the market and around maintaining dominance of particular sectors. Um, so when we talk about agricultural subsidies, actually should, should point out you know, that they are by no means distributed fairly. Um, there are certain sectors get a lot more. So the lamb and beef sector gets the bulk of direct payments in, in, in Scotland, um, despite that being the exact food that from a health and environmental point of view, we should be eating a lot less of, yet they still get lots of money. The fruit and veg sector, the horticulture sector gets hardly anything at all. So, so already from a public and environmental point of view, 
the, the, the there's there's we've lost that link between both between demand and supply but also between what it is we're actually want to achieve from spending our public money and that's that's due to a number of historical factors but it's also in part due to the the influence of um those particular sectors um, in scotland so the the, the from, from a numbers point of view the the number if you're looking at how many farmers we have in scotland and what they produce we have a lot more beef and sheep farmers than we have fruit and veg farmers and they've asserted their dominance over the years through the farmers union and through um agric other agricultural bodies and through government as well so we've ended up with a system that's that's very much in the favor of the large sector the large producer sectors who have quite a lot of dominance and want to keep it that way um, and i think there's a lot of it sometimes you know food, food campaigners um blame the european union for that and say oh but that's the common agricultural policy it's set up that way it absolutely doesn't have to be that way at all so there's actually quite a lot of flexibility within the common agricultural policy and other countries within europe um have managed to deliver it in a much fairer way you can you can do things like um you can give a premium to small farmers so you can say um you know farmers under a certain size are going to get more direct payments not only do we not do that in scotland but we actually have a, a we have a cap I think we're one of the only European countries that says if you're under a certain size, you don't get any money at all. So we're blocking smaller farmers from applying from it. Similarly, you can put an upper cap on the amount of money that people can get from agricultural subsidies. You can absolutely, it's within our EU member states' right to say we're all going to get we're only going to pay up to a certain area or we're only going to pay up to a certain amount. We chose not to do that as well. Um, and you can choose to take, take some of your money out of direct payments and put them into targeted projects for things like environmental work. And we've done that to an extent, but we never used our full capacity to do that. So we, and when I say we, initially I'm talking about the UK because um, for, 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 for a long time within the EU, these things were devolved, but you know they were still relatively controlled from the UK. But certainly the last 20 years of the Scottish Parliament, we've had full devolution. We've had the ability to make these changes and we've chosen to not do that. Okay, so a few things from that. First of all, what I'd like to ask about is kind of where does that leave us on an independence perspective, right? If if Scotland has had these powers and has chosen not to use them um, for whatever reason, like firstly, what what would you say the reason for that is the 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 kind of power of lamb and beef industries and kind of kind of dominating the subsidies available? Um, and yeah. with the same after independence, do you think? Um... The short answer is, is not automatically, no. So, so as a Green, um, I support independence, our party supports independence, but we support independence because of the possibilities of what we can do after independence. And we talk about independence in the context of the changes that we'd want to make and how we can make it fairer. Um, and they are by no means automatic. Now, as I said, there are some things, there are, you know, there are some areas where you can genuinely say, we've not been able to make change because we've not had the powers in parliament. So things like um, hope proper reform of, of, of taxation or introducing a universal basic income. You no, know, those are things that we genuinely can't do right now. Um, and it's good to talk about them in the context of independence because yeah, it would be, it would be like some really rad radical stuff that we could do, but there's lots of other stuff that will only change if there's political will. Um, so uh, it's not, it's not a, Independence is not a panacea, but I would hope that firstly, we'd end up with a wider range of voices in parliament. We'd stop, our parliament is, this is funny saying this as an independence supporter because a unionist will say this as well, but our parliament is completely dominated and hamstrung at the moment by the constitutional debate. It's very difficult to get things done. It's difficult to build cross-party support because it continues to fall along constitutional lines. Um, and yeah, it, it, it's hard to make any progress. Um, so independence would, would take that away. It would remove a lot of excuses. And I would hope it would allow, it would open up space within parliament for a broader range of voices on issues. And I would hope that there would be more progressive voices in parliament on that as well. So it's about, yeah, we'd, we'd, um, we'd need to make sure that we take that opportunity, but it just, it creates space for, for talking about that again. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um so my other question was, in terms of 
the majority of, kind of by number of farmers in Scotland being lamb and beef farmers, if I got that right. Um, what does that mean in terms of if those things are the worst for the environment and kind of, I guess, as kind of for sustainable food systems are moving in a direction of making things more locally produced, um, but we would want to move away from those kind of high carbon foods, kind of what sort of farming system can we envision that is like sustainable in Scotland? Yeah. So the interesting thing, so so meat meat definitely has a higher, it is, it is a high carbon food, but it is possible to produce it in a much more sustainable way. I think um, it's, I, I fully, I'm not vegan myself. I would say I was flexitarian and I, I don't eat a lot of meat at all. I'm, I'm reduced a bit meat I eat. But particularly in Scotland, it is possible to produce meat um, in, you can go as far as it being carbon neutral. Um, there are all different. There are lots of different ways that you can calculate environmental emissions from food, and it's not straightforward. In particular, because meat does not actually produce carbon. Well, it, certain elements of, of um, meat production produces carbon, but actually, when we're talking about meat, it's methane and uh, ammonia are kind of the two big climate change gases that we produce, and they they are treated in a different way in the environment. So, um, the de-intensification of the livestock industry has a massive impact on its environmental impact as well. Um, and then when you start to get down to really, really um, extensive systems, which are combined with other land uses, so things like having um, a system called silvopasture, pasture, which is where you graze um, sheep and goats, but also cows, sheep and goats are better, you graze them in forests. Um, there are, there's, um, like macro ecosystems in the West Coast where you graze animals extensively on, on the um, macro grazings. Those are practices that we've done for like, not just generations, you know, potentially like hundreds, potentially thousands of years in Scotland as well. And we always did them in an environmentally balanced way. It's the intensification of animal farming that's, that's, that's the climate um, issue. So, but because it's complicated, it, it makes it very easy for the industry to turn around and say, oh, well, we've been misrepresented. Actually, Scottish meat is fine and it's not an environmental problem. And the majority of Scottish meat, the way it produced is. So there's this kind of question going on around, yeah, like, do, 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 we, do we work towards creating better animal agriculture systems? Or do we say that that's not possible given our current population and the diets that people are choosing, and we explore alternatives instead. And I would say that there's no right or wrong to that. I would say that's two different approaches to take, and that they're both right. As long as you're looking to, to reduce your environmental impact, that's great. Um, but at the moment, um, yeah, it's easy for the industry to hide behind the complexities to say that meat and dairy, meat and dairy is not a problem in Scotland, when it is. My oven's beeping, two seconds, I'm going to go check up the cauliflower. <laughs> I'll just take this moment to talk about where I'm at in terms of the cooking stages, um, just so we're, we're all clear while Mags is checking her cauliflower. Um, I've chopped my onion and my garlic. Um, my lentils, I think, are cooked. They were looking a bit strange. Um, I think they're cooked, so that's good. Yeah, hope everyone else's cooking is going well. Um, Mags, how's your cooking going currently? My cauliflower, it's quite um, dark. But I think it's okay because you want it a little bit. Oh, I'm coming off it. Uh, you want some because this is the tangerine part. It's very kind of burnt. <laughs> I'm gonna check. You want to check it at the deepest part. Chunky yeah, it's looking good. I'm gonna put mine back in and turn the turn it down because what I realised was in the topping I'd filled my lentils up and put them on the stove and not switch the stove on. My lentils are a long way off being ready. <laughs> so I'm going to put this back in the oven to turn the heat right down and it'll continue cooking slowly. Nice. Nice. Mine also was looking a bit a bit sizzly. Um, so this is your warning to check your cauliflowers, um, folks. Um, yeah, mine looked a little sizzled, but I think it's fine. I think it's fine. I've turned, I've turned my down to like 100 and... 20 and it'll sit like that for ages and, it have and I bet that. that'll be really tasty as well a nice slow cooked cauliflower so since your lentils are you gonna wait until your lentils are cooked and then start the sauce or like yeah well 
I will wait until they're nearly done. So so the, the sauce bit is um it's called a tar cup. So you want to get the idea with this kind of dal recipe is that you take your lentils or your bread or whatever, and then you have all your spices in oil. And so you get all this lovely flavor in your oil and in your tomatoes. And then you just want to stir it through at the ends, really. Um, you can leave it to bubble for a while, but the flavor will change as you go. What you want is like a really like spicy, punchy oil that you stir through at the end. So yeah, I'm going to give my lentils. These lentils I've got are fairly fast cooking, actually. Um, sometimes I make this recipe with split peas instead, which is really good for the winter but it takes about two hours to cook. Um, whereas I've got nice quick cooking red lentils, so I'm going to leave them for a little bit and then I'll get started on my tarka. In which case, I might take this long to rinse my rice. Well, if, you, is anyone, if anyone's got any questions, I could continue talking for a bit whilst we go and wash your rice, if you want. <laughs> That's actually a perfect idea. You're being a far better host than I can be. So, um, okay, I know Lauren had a question, so I'll hand over to Lauren for that. Yeah, I have so many questions. I'm really interested in everything you want to say. I've kind of got a job right after I graduate, which I'm super happy about. And my clients will mostly be farmers and it's in the renewable sector. So I feel like what you've got to say is really relevant and I want to go with like, as much knowledge as possible. Um, but one of my questions was kind of around, so we had like a fashion event a couple of days ago for Go Green Week as well. And we had representatives from Bangladesh who were talking about the kind of having a general rule about the minimum price for something. So for example, like if you take like a chicken breast here, no, like everyone knows, you know, livestock is difficult for the environment. If you kind of have a minimum price, which means you can't have the mass produced meats that are coming from different countries, that'll kind of let the farmers here have, you know, a minimum price that they can set, it'll give them a better revenue. Is that the kind of governance that you think can maybe be helpful or why would something like that not work? I would kind of be interested to know that. Yeah. Um, it's interesting. So we, we've explored minimum pricing in the system in the past, particularly around about milk. So for a long time, the price of milk was controlled by the milk board and um, they made sure that farmers got a fair price for their milk um, and supermarkets and shops couldn't sell it any lower than that. Um, and since we scrapped that, the price of milk has gone through the floor and a uh, huge amount of dairy farms in Scotland have closed down. So it's interesting, we, do, we, we, we don't often talk about bringing back in price controls in Scotland. Uh, certainly our experience of having had them and trapped them was, was negative. Um, what I would say though is price controls need to be accompanied. Oh, my lentils are boiling over, sorry. <laughs> Just them out the corner of my eye, right? Turn that down. Okay, so um, yeah, you, your price controls, Price controls have to be accompanied by making sure that everybody receives a fair income in the first place. And so that's, um, sorry, these are good men. I'm trying to stop it. absolutely ruined my, uh, my um, cooker top. Yeah, um, cheap food in not just the UK, across the Western world has been, again, a, a political choice to drive down the cost of food in part using things like subsidies. It, on the back of that, it's allowed us to systematically drive down wages as well. So food in the UK and food in Scotland is far too cheap to the point where farmers can't make it from it. But also there's a lot of people out there who can't afford food. So we're in this awful situation where talking about food being more expensive is an absolute no-go because you're seen to then be saying, oh, well, people deserve to go hungry. And actually what we should be saying is, no, let's make sure everyone has enough money to live off through fair wages and also through schemes like universal basic income. And then we can start talking about making sure farmers get a fair price. And, and minimum prices may well be part of that. Particularly, I would say, as a very much a person of the left, I would say minimum pricing it, it only works when it's controlled. And again, from a food sovereignty point of view, when it's controlled by the producers themselves. So as I said, the Milk Marketing Board was, was um, to begin with, these farmers that were running it, towards the end, it was very much uh, daily businesses um, so it did become a bit taken over by that uh, but yeah you just need to make sure that the people who are juicing the food are the ones that are also setting the price as well yeah that um, makes complete sense because I suppose like the biggest kind of consumers of highly processed meat that comes that is imported to Britain will be low-income families I come from middle class yeah. um, not middle class 
working class family. I was raised on turkey twizzlers and fish fingers. And I understand yeah. if they were taken away from my mom, she probably would have been pretty pissed off. So, yeah. So yeah, um, yeah. I think there is definitely a balance to strike. Um, but yeah, okay, it's good to know that the priorities are kind of with getting people's wages and their income increase. This is another reason why I ended up getting involved in politics in general, because when you talk about food, like you're all, you're always just one or two steps talking about away from talking about wider political choices as well. Because you know, it is we all eat and we all we all make decisions every single day, but also because of that, so many other decisions around, you know, like around decisions around how much we pay people, decisions around the, the benefit system, um, you know, they have a knock on impact on the food system and on the food that we eat as well. So it's very difficult, I would say any anyone who's suggesting quick fix policies or quick fix ideas any issues in the food system don't trust them because it's not going to be an answer it's going to be a sticking plastic over the top because these things run so much deeper absolutely and i've got a second question so this is all this is like the same conversation like i did tie a job last year and <laughs> kind of looking in food sustainability is the same kind of question how do you strike up in Scotland as well, we have a particular culture of being so proud of how unhealthy we are when it comes to food sometimes. Look at everything we eat, fat fry, look at how little vegetables we have. And there is a balance between tackling the culture that we have um, when you're tackling also other issues like poverty and having fair prices for food and things. Um, and we, we like, so in the meantime, I've kind of been working a little bit on the Glasgow City Food Plan. Um, and tackling the culture in Scotland, I think, comes in hand with tackling food poverty. Um, and how do you go about that? Like, um, it's quite difficult to talk to people and tell them that they're wrong. You know, like it's yeah. not a fun thing to tackle. And I'm just wondering if you've kind of got any strategies around. Yeah, I mean, I think like everyone loves a chippy. Don't tell someone they're wrong for having a chippy once in a while. <laughs> it's like one of my favourite things. <laughs> but yeah, the issue is around. Um, uh, is, is, is people's daily diets. And I would argue that that's not a cultural thing. People, we, we haven't culturally decided to eat bad. We've been forced into that through accessibility and affordability. You know, if, if, if you're talking about feeding your kids turkey twizzlers there, you know, if you're on a tight budget um, and, and you live in an area where you can walk to your local Iceland, or you can save up your money to get a bus to the supermarket that actually has vegetables, but the vegetables are going to be expensive. You're going to, you know, go to the, you're going to go to Iceland and get a whole load of processed meat and feed your kids that because that should be the choice as well. So I think, yeah, I think we were, we we fall back on the culture thing far too often without talking about actually for a lot of people this isn't a choice. This is all they have. So you have to tackle accessibility, and, and there's different ways to do that. I think. Um, I'm not, I'm not a big fan of saying education because there's a, it's a, there's a very middle class approach to the, uh, tackling food problems, which is, oh, we all just need to learn how to cook. Let's all just teach people how to cook and educate them and it'll all be fine. But I think, again, I think that's a full large part bullshit. People don't, people don't cook because they don't know how to cook. They don't cook because they don't have the time and they don't have money to do it. Or they don't have like, the equipment to do it or they don't have money for the gas meter to run their cooker. Um, but I would say educational settings are a, are a good way to introduce kids to different diets. So school meals are really important. We're currently campaigning to get free school meals extended to um, all children. I mean, our green policy is to have all kids at school, primary school and high school, get a free school meal. Um, we're starting with primary school kids and we're discussing that with the Scottish government at the moment and we're pretty hopeful we might make progress around about that. But normalising a healthy low you know low carbon so like meat free um meal in the middle of the day for kids um is is a big way to address the culture issue which i don't think it's culture issue, but just making that accessible making it normal for kids to sit down and have a plate full of you know a nice like veggie curry with their pals or you know sit and have fruit afterwards and things like that so, so you can you can shift diet through mechanisms like that as well but you also have to yeah, look at the wider issue around that. Why are actually people actually eating it this way? Is it because they want to eat this way and they like to eat this way? Or is it because they've been brought up eating that way because they live in a community and in circumstances where that's their only choice? I think that like our parents' generation, they came from like the microwave reel generation yeah. where it was like the best thing ever. And we lost a lot of these cooking skills. 
Um, so there is a part of education there that I think is important. I had to learn how to cook from my friends who came from other countries. Yeah, no, I think you've heard a lot of good points. Thank you so much for answering that. Yeah, yeah, no, I should point out, yeah, no, there is definitely a skills gap there, but we also, you can't just teach somebody skills and it's solved. You have to then make sure that they're able to follow through on that. I'm going to start my lentil softening, so I'm going to start on my, frying my onions now as well. Okay, sweet. I'm going to do the same. Um, I'm a copycat. I was waiting for you, like ugh, the sheep that I am. So we need to put some oil in the pan. How yeah, about- and you want you want quite a bit of oil. I think I put three tablespoons on the recipe, but actually you want to put more and go for it because as I say, that's what gives the flavour is you're going to get all those spices and onion stuff into the oil. So kind of leading on from even Lauren's question, um, what... After the next Scottish Parliament election, like what what would you like to see happen? Um, what do you think is doable? Um, what direction would you like to see everything move in? Um, yeah. yeah. So um, immediately, um, it would be good to see some kind of food policy bill brought back, um, whether that's a good nation bill or a right to food bill. Um, it was a really good idea and it was a massive missed opportunity that we didn't follow through on that. Um, we also we desperately need to, so we're talking earlier about us copying and pasting the common agricultural policy. Um, we've only done that for the next four years and policy takes time to develop. So we desperately need to start developing a new agricultural support scheme um, and one that puts public goods at the heart of it. So reprofiles money towards pro- producing the things that we should be eating more of, like fruit and veg, and di- take, directing money away from things like meat, which we, we know we should be eating less of. Um, and also um, supporting farmers, supporting farmers to make the changes that need to be changed that done in the industry as well. I think we, it's a very unique industry farming in that it's, it's, not, it's not just a job, it's your lifestyle. And most people have been born into it. They come from farming families. Um, Scotland's pretty, so the UK in general um, uh, still has very traditional um, legacy, you know, you inherit the job and the farm after your dad or whatever. People generally don't go to agricultural college, unlike in other parts of Europe, where ag- even if you're from a family, farm and family, you go to agricultural college. People in Scotland often don't go to agricultural college, they just learn on the job. So when we're talking about making a change, it's not just something that can be done overnight. We're having to, we're going to have to really reskill um, and, and educate but not in a patronizing way our farmers about what it is actually we're trying to achieve um because it's not their fault you know they again it t- t- talking about families there and lack of cooking skills and things farmers are in the exact same position when it comes to tackling climate change is you know it's it's a tradition and it has been done that way for several generations now um you know most of the 20th century and if we're expecting them to do it a different way we need to we really support them to do that so so um Farm um, training schemes, um, farm advisory services, because again, we're not just talking about tweaking what you're doing a little bit, we're talking about giving businesses here mm-hmm. so that uh, they are adopting climate friendly practices, they're diversifying if needs be, you know, they're, they're switching the kind of food that they produce, you know, shifting away from animal agriculture toward other land uses, that kind of stuff. These farmers are getting paid better and they're relying a lot less on direct subsidy that everyone's going to benefit. Yeah, that's going to two bills. Okay, in terms of re-educating or, okay, um, using using that term tentatively um, or kind of working on skilling farmers up in terms of sustainability, what do you think is the current attitude among farmers to sustainability? Like, I think there's maybe an idea in maybe like environmental communities, at least among students, at least, from my sense of things that, you know, farmers aren't doing enough, they're reluctant, they're a bit stuck in the past. I'm just wondering from your own, your actual work and expertise in this area, if you think that's an accurate picture or if it's unfair. Um, no, I mean, it varies massively. I mean, farmers are just the same as the general population. You get people who are really on it and really care about climate change and are doing the absolute best that are kind of completely upturning their lives around. Um, and then you get people who who are kind of on board with it, and but you know maybe a little bit slower and need a little bit of support. And then you get people that are full on skeptics as well. And and the farming community is not a homogenous uh, um, community at all. You, you get a good range of it. What I would say, my experience working with farmers is it 
farmers care. They care about the land and they care about the animals that they look after. And I do think that um, that they are unfairly portrayed as being uncaring sometimes. Um, I, I would just say, you know, they, they genuinely do care and they, they want to make a living and they want to protect their land. Um, there's just, there's not always an agreement with what the best way to do that is. And also, it, it, we, we as, a, as a community of activists, but also, you know, the, the work that, the, the, that politicians have done so far to try and change things hasn't always, we've not always approached it in a right way or an inclusive way. Um, so we often, we, I like to talk about a just transition, you know, if you're involved in climate activist circles, you'll, you'll know the term just transition, which is about um, winding down fossil fuels, but making sure that the people who work in fossil fuels are brought along board with it and that they are part of the, part of the decision making process around about that and train in other areas and that they use their expertise to build a zero carbon energy system. It's exactly the same with farmers, like we have to make sure that we're bringing people on board and that we're using their skills and their understanding that we already have around the land to, to maximise the, the potential that that land has to um, recuperate and to sequester carbon and to produce food as well. There's yeah. no one size fits all, really. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, that makes absolute sense. Um, I'm currently adding my curry leaves, which are making quite an alarming sound. Oh, yes, they should do. Yes, they should pop. That's what you want. Well, my onions are just um, I mean, yeah, I, I would just you know, give a shout out to there are some really good farmers in Scotland who are not only on board with this, but are like active champions for, for sustainable farming. Um, there's, you know, there's, there's some, some people doing really interesting and innovative stuff and are, are keen to put that out there. And I would say it's worth hunting those people down and supporting if you can afford to and you have access to it, whatever, supporting them with your money. You know, if you choose to eat meat and dairy, make sure it's the absolute best meat and dairy that you can get hold of um, and that you are rewarding for it. You're choosing to shop in a certain way. Um, because again, if, if we can make it, we can make it economically interesting for farmers, they're also more likely to make that switch as well. Yeah. Um, Ewan Smith has a question, so I will hand over to you over to Ewan for that question. Um, hi all, uh, my name's Ewan, I am the co-convener of the Glasgow Uni Greens and I'm Scottish Young Greens Election and Campaigns Officer. Um, Mags, I wanted to pick up on something you briefly mentioned earlier, like um, obviously uh, the, the, Green, the Scottish Greens generally and very particularly the Young Greens are a very middle class organisation mm -hmm. and there is a it was when you were talking about, oh, we just need to educate people. This was what got me thinking about this. I think there's a sort of broader perception amongst the middle classes that working class people aren't curious about food, that they don't want to cook nice things or interesting things or new things. And and I'm, I'm not going to pretend to be working class, but, you know, how should we be sort of challenging that? No, that's a really good question, actually. Um, I mean, what I would say is... It's the best way to challenge any stereotype is to get people in a room together and to get people talking and to see each other. And I think we have our our food culture is so heavily class based. So I would say any opportunities that you can get challenged that um, by getting people eating together is really important. I've done a lot of work in the past around um, do, doing community food, as I mentioned at the start, um, and doing cooking sessions with communities where people come together and cook and eat and, and cook and eat food with with neighbors but the way that our society in Scotland set up is your neighbors are often you know of a similar class to you um so yeah that's I don't know I think it's part of a I think it comes uh, at, along with wider issues to, to tackle class inequalities in Scotland and to uh, break down break down those barriers and make sure that people are mixing with folk from all classes and none, um, and that we're providing equal opportunities to people right from the early days of their life, um, which starts with the, the school years. Go support your local chippy. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to repeat the fact that chippies are good once in a while is a treat. <laughs> I couldn't agree more. That's what I always yeah. say. Like when we were doing our work at Guest with the Glasgow City Food Plan, and there were all these chats about like fried food and it being awful for you, I just have to say every time. I love chips. Like it's <laughs> like even me. I'm very lazy. I will walk for chips. So yeah, absolutely. Um, also, I mean, just thinking about like our idea of class food, like traditional Scottish food 
would have been, you know, a lot of traditional Scottish food like stovies or a really good pot of soup, <laughs> um, you know, or like, yeah, like, or like traditional like pies and stuff like that. And we've got, we have some really good bakeries in Fife. We have a good firm, I absolutely love. Stephen's Bakery does the best baked Fridays you could possibly imagine. <laughs> They're not good for you or for the environment. But like, there's, 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 there's good quality traditional food that would have, you know, that, that working class communities still eat. Um, and I think we could do more to talk about those and celebrate those when we're talking about Scottish food. Um, yeah, rather than trying to re resort into class stereotypes. Mm -hmm. I'm just putting my um, my mustard seeds and my curry leaves in my oil, so this is where it might fizz. Two teaspoons of mustard seeds. I just realised I've done things in completely the wrong order um, by not following the recipe. Um, I've put all my spices in and not my onions and my garlic. So, uh, well, it should be all right actually. Just the, the spices. Just make sure the spices don't burn as you're cooking your onion. The onion will take a wee while to soften down. Um, so as long as you're stirring it and the and the spices aren't burning, you should be okay. My lentils are getting thick now and they're gone like um all bored or bubbly. This is this is like a slightly suspect segue. I don't know if it's really very legitimate to try and segue in this way um but just to hear you talk about the five and done from which from reading i did a small bit of research before this um so nothing nothing bonkers just read a few articles um but um i know that's where you're from and that you you as you said earlier you went to new zealand um and then you came back and you have now settled and you're running to kind of represent that area in scottish parliament um See, this is a really suspect segue. It's not really a real segue at all. Um, I am from a smallish rural place. I think this is my my own like selfish desire because I just want to talk about small rural towns um, and the fact that I'm ashamed um, because it is a Tory constituency, both in the Scottish Parliament and in Westminster. Um, but then, kind of last time we spoke, initially we were talking about the interesting how it's interesting that in kind of rural places farmers often are conservative voters. So I just, I'm interested to talk about that a little bit for purely selfish reasons, because I'm trying to reconcile being from a Tory constituency with being the leftist person that I am. <laughs> no, it's really interesting. And yeah, so when I, um, yeah, I lived in New Zealand for a while, um, New Zealand politics is sort of similar to the UK. Um, it, 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 they have their parliament is is actually a multi-member system the same as the Scottish Parliament, but it's also it's dominated by Labour and their version of the Conservatives, which is called National National Party. The National Party was founded, but we started out with the Farmers Party. It was actually founded by farmers and is still to this day dominated by farmers. And if you're in New Zealand, you also you always vote National. Um, and I don't think, yeah, I think you know, being of the left. You know, I appreciate how it's it's easy to demonise conservatives as the nasty party, and certainly over the last few years, they absolutely demonstrated that as well. But I think play here is a much more fundamental. Um, it, it's a much more fundamental style of politics, um, small c conservatism versus Labour, and and a historical division between rural and urban interests as well, um, and a perception that, that that they don't go together. I do think. Um, I mean, I think it comes in part from being um, the fact that farmers generally work in quite isolated ways. Um, it's a very precarious industry to be in. You know, it's, it's you're self-employed. You have a lot of land and animals to look after. There's a huge amount of risk involved in being a farmer, and you're not part of a big business or a big organisational structure that can support you in that. I think it does lend itself towards more small C conservative politics. Um, people are going to be cautious about making big changes. This goes back to what I was talking about earlier, but you need to support farmers through, through the transition at the moment, because it's, it's a lot to ask. It's very easy for us who are middle class students or who work in the third sector or even working in politics, whatever, having secure jobs, to sit and list off a whole load of ideas. We're not the ones that actually have to go out there and do that. We're not the ones that are being asked to put their businesses on the line in order to do that. So I think that's why conservative politics is more likely to appeal to farming communities because there's a lot at risk there. And conservative politics says, we will look after you as an individual, you're hardworking, we, we value that, we are not gonna make you do something you don't want to do. 
So I think, you know, we can learn from that in our approach. We can alter our approach to, to learn from that as well. But you certainly shouldn't be ashamed because you come from an area that votes Tory. That's, and also, also we have to recognise that this is how we vote the same way for, for years and years. People don't question it. My partner's from Shetland and I'm constantly ripping him. I don't know anybody, like, spend a lot of time up in Shetland. I don't know anybody who's a Lib Dem. There's people in the Fremont, there's people in Fife who still vote Labour, even though they're independent supporting and they've been completely screwed over by Labour governments for generations. But they just do it because they've always done it. So there's definitely that kind of historical thing going on as well. Mm. And, you know, in terms of talking about being ashamed from somewhere that votes Tory, I think it's kind of, it is, it is reconciling that small C conservatism versus our current, the, the kind of conservative government that we are that we're dealing with in Westminster um so yeah yeah okay yeah, and I think as well it's worth thinking as well you know as anyone who's kind of active in politics we always try and say this to, to our activists which is you have to remember that you are an absolute freak like most people do not know that much about politics they don't always care that much about politics and they certainly don't spend as much time thinking about politics as we do um so yes, yeah, so, so voting conservative in your in your local area, you know, they're they're gonna be thinking about their families and their businesses, and you know, more and more these days they're thinking about Brexit and independence, but they're not spending ages thinking about the rape clause or you know, things like all these awful things that that, that the Tories have done. So yeah, that's always another thing to bear in mind as well. I've got my spices and my onions all cooking. I'm gonna I'll get my phone over here and show you. Got my, well, it's all going to steam up now, isn't it? You can tell. You can tell I don't do any kind of social media. <laughs> but anyway, I'm going to put my half ton of tomatoes in now. If I was doing this in the summer and there were decent summer tomatoes, I would use fresh tomatoes. But buying fresh tomatoes in winter is pretty pointless. So, Mags, like uh, you're talking there about like um, it's the same thing as like breaking out the green bubble or breaking out of the sort of climate aware bubble talking to people about issues that they care about do you have sort of broader thoughts about that now that we can especially only do social media campaigning we're only talking yeah. to ourselves and activists are only talking to ourselves yeah social media has made it very social media and the pandemic makes it very difficult i mean i think what we need to from a political point of view we need to be more encompassing of traditional media as well um and um yeah. Sorry for those of you who aren't in the Greens, I'm going to go off on a big Green strategy <laughs> chat now. But yeah. Greens as a party ha have done a lot better in recent years in getting into mainstream media. Not just talking about the environment um, eh, in mainstream media, but talking about the, the big picture. It's not enough to just um, save some pandas and to all fly a little bit less, that we have to address the structural inequality have led to that and so that's a lot a lot harder i'm just going to show you that my uh my target is looking absolutely delicious i'm going to get my get this camera out oh look at that so that's all my onions and my tomatoes and i'm going to put that in my um lentil, in my lentils um that's great we're talking right talking about issues in a way that um resonates with people's everyday lives is really important again this brings it back down to, to food as well going in where people are struggling with uh, access to food and poverty and the likes and telling them that the meat that they're eating is killing the planet is not a productive way to do it at all. So we have to talk about issues in a way that relates to people's lives and for, for um, both environmental activists and food sovereignty activists and you know, the Greens, that doesn't mean dumbing it down, but it means talking about stuff in real language and relating it to people's real life experiences. So that's why things like school meals are so important because it, it, it's a real leveler and it's an opportunity that everybody has. Um, and if we can get decent free school meals in front of every single child, um, it starts to make food issues and food justice issues relevant to people. The other thing I think as campaigners as well that we, we tend to do um, is to make things too complicated and think that we have to be really in-depth and really knowledgeable all the time. And actually, no matter what you're campaigning about, you know, one of the best things about campaigning is you can see it over and over again. And people will, you think that you're repeating yourself um, and you think you're really boring, but actually, particularly on things like social media, people will only pick up on 
like a very small portion of what you say about something. So repeating it over and over again is going to maximize your impact and is going to hopefully people see that. Hello. Um, how's your cauliflower looking, Max? Hi. <laughs> it is quite dark, but it'll be lovely and tasty inside. So yeah, I've turned off my oven now and I think my dal is ready as well now, actually. So that's all pretty much good to go. I guess we just had a question from Max um, about sustainability. <laughs> and we were wondering whether, um, is it a necessity to be vegan, to be sustainable, do you think? It's easier to be vegan and be sustainable. Um, as I was saying before, it is possible to produce meat and dairy in agricultural systems, which are not only climate neutral, but can, can actively benefit ecosystems. Um, so agroecology, and agroecology is kind of like a blanket term for agriculture, which mimics and works alongside ecosystems. And animals are a really important part of ecosystems. And it, it, if, we, if we're creating sustainable ecosystems, animals need to be included in that. And we don't need to eat those animals, but um, if, if we're modeling our agrological systems or ecosystems, we need to try and factor animals into that somehow. Um, but that being said, at this present time, it's, very, it's difficult to find properly, sustainably produced meat and dairy in Scotland. Um, it is easier, much, much easier to find, to find organic vegetables. Um, it's, it's even, you know, even when we're factoring in things like um, meat substitutes and products that are flown in from around the world, um, they're still got, in general, particularly if you're able to afford organic produce, um, you know, things like the lentils that we're eating tonight, um, like chickpeas and tofu and things like that, are still going to have a much more uh, environmental impact than your bog standard meat and dairy. Um, so, so I would say so for most people, if, if, if sustainability, if environmental sustainability is a, a big priority for you and you don't have the time or money to spend hunting out really good quality um, meat and dairy, I think if, if, if sustainability is your most important factor, um, absolutely talk about veganism, but there is misinformation out there around being vegan as being the only way to eat. Um, because it's not the case, and particularly if um, you know, we absolutely, as environmentalists, should not be targeting people who live like smallholder lifestyles, for example, so crofting communities in Scotland. Um, th there is some really fantastic work going on in crofting communities at the moment, early on, reintroducing trees to rural areas whilst having small scale meat and dairy productions alongside those, um, are doing wonders for diversifying ecosystems in rural parts of Scotland. And, you know, if we're environmental activists, we should be encouraging that, not demonising it for not being vegan. Okay, sweet. A comprehensive answer from Max. Thank you. Okay, since you all finished cooking, Max, and we're, we're drawing to the end, I have a final question, and then I'll let you go and enjoy your dinner. Um, um, which is, okay, so we've spoken all about food policy and politics and all of that good stuff. Um, for the people who are here tonight or will be watching this recording afterwards. Um, what do, do you have any advice or routes for students to kind of try and make a difference in the food systems we have? Um, what do you think is the, the direction people should, should be taking? So um, I would say, so from a food sovereignty point of view, I would say get involved with a local project. Um, and again, talking about making big barriers and meeting different people and stuff like that. There's some, um, it's been a while since I've lived in Glasgow or done any work in Glasgow, but there's some, Pretty sure there's still some excellent local projects in Glasgow that people can be getting involved in, a range of different um, community gardens, go and spend some time um, growing food. And yeah, community garden projects also have cooking projects alongside that, so you can learn some skills, meet other people, um, and um, sit down and cook and eat together. And if, if you can meet people from different backgrounds to you whilst you're doing that, then, then all the better. Um, I'd also say look around at where you're spending your money and try and support local businesses, and particularly local businesses that have an ethical stance. Um, if you're near a locavore, well done you. I love locavore. They've done a fantastic amount of work. I um, first went to locavore when they had, when it was just Ruben in one shop on the south side. About, oh, you want to look at what about us? Excellent, yeah. Go along. Um, I think there's still uh, a, a tech and community interest company as well. So they're often looking for people to be like voluntary board members for them, that kind of thing. If you want to get more involved in, in how systems work, um, you know, people, people like them are great to be part of. If you want to read up 
in the UK, there's an organisation called the Land Workers Alliance, which is mostly based down in England, but they do really good stuff around food sovereignty. Um, globally, there's an organisation called La Via Campesina, which is the, the peasants' rights movement, which was, was kind of like the, the guiding body of the, the food sovereignty movement. They are good ones to look at as well. Um, so yeah, just go out, get involved, ask lots of questions. I think, especially when it comes to when it comes to sustainability, there's no right and well, there's no, there are right and wrong ways to do it. <laughs> there's no perfect way to do it. Is the thing try trying to be a bit better and to eat a bit better. And um, particularly, I really want to ram home that environmental action is nothing without social justice as well. So it's all, you know, think about not just how your food is produced, but who you're buying your food from, whether they're making a living from that. And if there's a way that you can ensure that more of your money goes towards, far, goes directly to farmers who are growing in a sustainable way, locally, then you're doing an amazing job. Okay, great. Lots of different avenues there as well. Um, so do one or all of those things um, if you're interested. That would be in which case, um, I'd like to say thank you to everyone for coming tonight, but especially thank you to Max um, for offering your expertise on a wide range of issues. Um, it was really interesting. Yeah, I am. Yeah. I'm excited to, to re-watch this while I edit it and absorb it for a second time um, when I'm not trying to cook lentils simultaneously. No, I forgot how much lentils boil over. I'm like, ah, I'm trying to talk and stop. My oven is such a mess. I'm going to have to really scrub it now. <laughs> uh, if anybody wants to get in touch with me, though, I'm always happy to chat on Twitter. I think I'm at Mags SGP. Yes, I am. SGP for Scottish Green Party. Yeah, give me a shout out on Twitter. Um, I, I talk about... Lots of politics stuff, but also lots of food stuff as well. I still try and post lots of um, interesting food content there, talking about food politics and stuff. So uh, give me a follow and drop me a uh, message something. I feel like I can't emphasize it enough. I just want to say it again. Thank you so much for joining. <laughs> it's okay. Um, thank you. Fun. You can thank you guys. <laughs> okay, and everyone's hungry, so everyone got to go. Okay, sweet. Well, thanks so much, Max. Have a lovely evening. Enjoy your enjoy yeah. your time. Bye.